All right, well, good evening and welcome to the WA Museum for the International Year of Biodiversity. And tonight we're kicking off Series 2, which runs from now until November. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Catherine Belcher and I'm the Regional Manager. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you here tonight to Creatures of the Night, Geckos and Frogs of Western Australia. And Dr. Paul Doughty is the Curator of Herpetology in the Department of Terrestrial Zoology at the Western Australian Museum down in Perth. His interests are in the evolution and ecology of lizards, frogs and snakes. He began this interest and study in North America as an undergraduate in Seattle, Washington. He did his master's at the University of Tennessee in animal behaviour on side blotched lizards in central California and in 1992 he moved to Sydney to work with Professor Rick Schein on the evolution of life history traits in skinks and geckos and attained his PhD in 1996. He's been working with the WA Museum since 2003 and the current projects he's been working on are geckos and frogs and their systematics, but he's also interested in specific groups of dragons and skinks. Tonight he's going to be specifically talking about geckos and frogs of Western Australia and um, Yes, I'd like to welcome him for, I think it's his second or third time here in, in Geraldton and we're always really pleased to have him back. So please welcome Dr. Paul Doughty. Great. Thanks, Catherine. Um, thanks for coming out on this uh, nice night. Um, and I guess as far as a, a preamble for this talk, I've, I've given, uh, talked about frogs here before um, and other than this afternoon at Nagel College, uh, this, you're the guinea pigs for the gecko talk. So it's about time to get some, some geckos in there, so um, I hope you like it. Um, well, there's two main kinds of nocturnal animals. Um, so uh, geckos on the, on the left, it's one of the oldest reptile groups, which I'll go over in a second. Um, frogs is a little bit more ancient group, because they're that transition group between the, the water and the land. They're still tied to the water. Um, in, in Australia, the geckos have an extremely high diversity, as with reptiles in general. Reptiles in Australia, is, it's, a, it's a great place to be if you're studying reptiles because it's one of the most diverse places. The deserts are chock full of reptiles. Um, because it's a dry continent, frogs, there's reasonable diversity, but it's not like Brazil or anything. There's a lot of dry stuff. Um, so there's a lot of diversity up in the, the wetter bits, like the southwest here and up north and on the eastern seaboard. All right, well, we'll start out with geckos. Um, now, as far as the sort of reptilian lizard tree of life, um, this fellow here, the tuatara, is slightly older than geckos, but um, from most of what we know, based on the bone structure and recent genetic stuff, Geckos are the second off the rank of living reptiles. So they've been around for quite some time. They might have started out as a diurnal type uh, reptile, but the vast majority these days are nocturnal, night dwelling. The um, notable exceptions are the uh, Madagascar Felsuma group, which are um, popular with, um, in the reptile husbandry you know, across the world. They turn, they're blue and green and run around like normal sort of lizards. And the New Zealand geckos um, are also often, they're green and live in trees and uh, they're very day active. We have a few things like that, but I'll, I'll get to those. All right, well, one of the, the old, oldest group of geckos um, has a funny feature which um, our geckos and all the other geckos uh, don't have, and that is that they blink. So this is a, a leopard gecko. Again, it's a, um, popular in the, in the pet trade in North America. My little brother had one. Um, so that, these guys actually blink. The, all of our geckos have a fixed spectacle, like a snake, like snake eyes. So um, don't try to enter a staring contest. You'll, you'll lose. <laughs> All right, this is just a bit of, um, just a bit of background. 
So the, the oldest group of these, Eublepharines, and they have this sort of funny distribution, um, and it's a classic sort of evolutionary distribution of a really old group. So there's some in North America, some in the Middle East, some get as far as Southeast Asia, um, but they're really sort of fragmented when modern groups rise up and separate them. So they're the, they're the oldest. Um, we're lucky in Australia and New Caledonia and New Zealand. We have these guys here. These, these are quite long names, so I'll let you read those at your leisure. Um, and then we have a few um, more modern cosmopolitan type geckos, um, which, are, which get around the place. Spherodactylines and phyllodactylines, these last two, those are more um, in the Americas, especially South and Central America. Um, but the Gekonidae, uh, they're just everywhere, including Australia. All right, why geckos are cool? Why, 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 are, they, why are they so neat? Well, one thing with the, um, it's just a sort of an idea, with the nocturnality, they can just get away with a little bit more fun in the color department. Um, a lot of the um, insects and lizard patterns that you see um, are basically uh, designed by the eyes of birds. Okay, birds are a modern super group. Um, so if you're a, a tasty animal running out there, um, you're going to have colors designed to be not seen by birds. Um, so I think when you see some of the brightly colored geckos and frogs out there, you think, well, maybe there's a bit of uh, release of this um, bird predation, and they can get away with some colors. And you'll see some quite um, funky-looking geckos and frogs coming up. They've got big eyes. Okay, they, they need to take in all the light that they can um, to avoid things like owls and see the food running around. So, um, I mean, snakes are sometimes a hard sell to get people to like them. Frogs and geckos, it's not a hard sell. They've got big eyes. They're cute. Um, diversity, uh, you'll see a lot of the names of uh, geckos reflected in their feet. They have all these sort of crazy sticky structures which work on very uh, fine molecular properties, which I won't go into too much. Um, but their structure of the feet um, is quite diverse in how they grip onto the surfaces. Um, it's a great taxonomic tool. If you're um, getting up on the ears like me and have lifted rocks and logs uh, for many decades. If you switch to a nocturnal uh, frog and gecko catching, you don't have to lift as much. They're out there. They think you can't see them, but I have my uh, miner's torch on, and I can just pick them up. And um, so running around in the sun in the day, lifting up big slabs of rock, which I used to, uh, you know, doctor's orders, I don't do that anymore. So um, that's another reason why why I've gotten into my, I suppose. Right, so you'll see this a lot with the Australian group, the Diplodactylae, that's two-toed. Um, it's more like two parts of the toe, um, so you'll just see that name quite a little bit. Um, it's the most diverse group, so I'll uh, start with them. And it's basically divided into these cave geckos and clawless geckos. These are really ancient groups, um, the ground dwellers, in the climbers. All right, well, this, this is a um, giant Kimberley cave gecko, and you've got other species in the top end and in Cape York as well. And that's that sort of relictual distribution hanging on the top of Australia. Um, their nearest relatives are probably the New Caledonian radiation, so that's quite an ancient um, connection there. Now, these guys are interesting because... Um, and, and you'll see geckos use their tails for sort of clever um, inventions every so often. But the um, tip of the tail has a little, um, it's like a little toe pad on the rest of it. So that tip, tail tip has evolved to grip because these guys are climbing around in trees um, that are nestled amongst rocks. And, well, this tail's hanging around. You might as well use it. And if you, you know, look, touch the tail, it, it actually will sort of, stick onto you. So that's just one. You watch this space as far as different uses of gecko tails. And these guys are quite big. They can be like this big with a tail and everything. I got bit a few times and it really hurts. Okay, these are uh, the opposite side of this, the size spectrum. These are the little tiny 
clawless geckos. Okay, these are divided up into a few subspecies at the moment, but um, we're working on um, splitting them up into more species. And it's that problem in um, taxonomy that usually people take on the big ones first and leave the, the small ones that you have to sort of strain your eyes, to look at, <laughs> leave those to later, but we're finally um, getting around to them. They come in sort of two basic varieties. You've got the um, rocky dweller, that's sort of a southwest one there. Sort of looks a bit granitic, and they hang out in black boys as well. And then you've got these stripy guys, which are obligate spinifex dwellers. They, they um, run around on other things as well. But they've got stripes and spinifex, and they rarely leave the bush. And so those are quite cool little guys. Now, the, the most of the diversity is in these ground-dwelling um, diplodactyly geckos. So you've got three uh, main genera. This just has one species in it at the moment. This is a Rhynchodura um, ornata species. It's a beak-faced gecko, so you can see that um, beaky little face, and it's a termite specialist. It eats almost nothing but termites. Loves them. <laughs> it's got the face to match it. There's a couple of other new species in that group, um, and I'm uh, working with a student in um, ANU on that. Okay, here's your sort of bread and butter diplodactylus type geckos. Now, once upon a time, this was all um, just one species. So I know you're saying, well, they're not that different. But really they are. If you look at the genetics of these guys, some of them have diverged by about 10 or 12 million years old if we look at the genetics. And I'm working with a student on, in Adelaide on that sort of thing. So in, in the last year or so, we've, um, well, there's an exception to that. These two are, are a new species. That's the south coast one. This is a great Victoria Desert one here. And then this one up there is the, um, the wheat belt uh, gecko. This one here, for some reason, is the most weird looking one of all of them. It's called, um, it's got the subspecies name of Rex, which means king, because it's the, the biggest one, the most distinct. Yet, genetically, it's exactly the same as that one. With very recent divergence. So we don't know if it's in the process of speciating or what's going on, but I think um, with geckos and frogs, there's a lot of weird stuff that happens that doesn't always make sense. Um, can be a bit difficult to work with and try to understand, but um, that's why we like nature. It doesn't always make sense, but, you know, it looks good. <laughs> <coughs> All right, so here's some more, um, uh, more diplodactylines. This is a Darling Range one here, this little one that blends into the rocks quite well. Um, that's polyophthalmus. It means it has many eyes. And that's Diplodactylus ornatus from um, up along the coast. You, this is a local one here. Sorry, this one here. That's a Shark Bay thing that that photograph is from. This big guy here, he's got a very funny um, habitat because he's in the uh, Pilbara endemic. But he's not on the rocks. He's only on these cracking clays. So... If you look at the environment where these things are, there's, there's not many trees. There's just nothing. And this guy has quite longer limbs than the other um, of its relatives. It's got these great big, you can see the skies, size of the scales on the back. They're larger for some reason. It's got a nice flat head. And, yeah, he's just a cracking clay specialist, a very weird sort of gecko that lives in these crevices um, up in the Pilbara. This guy on the lower right, he was used to be lumped in with that um, Diplodactylus micheli, the, the cracking clay one. Basically, the pattern has converged to kind of look the same, but after um, some genetic studies and a bit more detailed look at them, uh, that was described as a new species just a couple of years ago, and that's actually more, create, uh, more closely related to the geckos on the previous slide. So it's that thing where evolution is, can sometimes make things look the same. Sometimes it makes them look different. It, it's really interesting. 
Okay. Now, these guys also like termites, and they also have the beak face. Um, but these guys are not their closest relatives. They, it's a second and third evolution of this termite specialization with this sort of tweezery kind of beaky face. Now, this one here and, and this one here, these are, are closely related. Um, this is a species that was described about 10 years ago. Um, but in, this, in the population of this one, you also get those saddle, saddle patches. And then half the individuals have these stripes. So it's just one of those weird polymorphism things. Maybe the striped ones go faster. I don't know. It hasn't been tested. This one here is a, um, it has this flat tail there. Now, theoretically, that tail um, is used to plug spider burrows where it lives. Okay, now this, this theory's been around a long time. I'm not sure how you'd go um, to test it, but it does have that sort of flat paddle-shaped tail. And it might be something where they, they um, during the day, they sort of chill out in the spider burrow and put the tail up to keep other things from coming to disturb them, or maybe it's a thermal thing. That's an open question to, um, to test. Uh, this one here, that's um, Australia's newest reptile that was just described earlier in the year. Um, it was, uh, me and my colleagues split it off from a closely related thing in the Pilbara. Um, within the Pilbara, you have a bit of speciation happening, as well as um, things in the Pilbara speciating from other areas of, of WA. So uh, I spend a lot of time in the Pilbara, and it's a special space, uh, special place for geckos, one of the richest, um, uh, diverse places for geckos in Australia. So that's um, Diplodactylus galaxius, because I thought it sort of looked like stars somehow. Sometimes it's hard to come up with names. <laughs> um, now, these are the um, Lucasium group, and they're um, kind of like the previous Diplodactus, but a little bit skinnier, a little bit more built for speed, and these guys um, definitely run a bit quicker when you um, try to catch them, as I found out. So we have a, um, this is a desert-dwelling one here. This is a species... Um, Lucasium bungabina, because it's the um, yellow binna sand plain in South Australia and the bungabin sand plain in WA. So I worked on this with the South Australian Museum curator, and we said, let's just smash the names together and we'll call it that. So that's where that thing lives. It's sort of um, in the sand plain belt um, below the, um, the Great Victoria Desert. This is another Pilbara endemic in the lower right. Um, it's a rocky dweller. It's red, it blends, blends into the rock a bit, and it also has a bit of that star pattern. I'm not sure what the star pattern does, but it seems to work for them. And there's a, um, another arid outback gecko emerging from his spider hole. So I told you there's a lot of them. <laughs> so now let's look at some, uh, we'll get away from the ground, we'll climb up, climb up the trees. So um, these guys look a little bit different from each other, but they're all in the same group, this Strophurus group. And what they all have in common is this tail here, which if you molest the gecko or if you um, uh, hassle it or, or grab onto it, it has this oozy, gooey tail stuff, which will, it'll give to you. Um, and even these spiny tails here, you can see the spines on the tail, um, there's, there's accounts of if, if something's um, hassling the gecko, it'll um, curve its tail around and sort of fling the goo onto the face of whatever it's trying to uh, scare it. So um, it's a nice little defensive tactic. Um, and they do lose the tail if you, um, you know, grab onto it, like a lot of these geckos, it, um, it, it'll fall off. Back. Yes, it grows back. Um, the spines on these spiny tails don't grow as well, but because um, uh, the bone, you can't regrow the bone, but there's sort of a cartilage replacement. It's um, nature's um, limb replacement sort of idea. Um, so these spiny tails, 
they'll, um, they're in sort of low shrubs and, and trees, and they love the sun. They're um, funny among the geckos in that they have a black um, lining inside of the gut. And this is presumably sort of a UV protection because they'll have a feed at night and then climb up into the hi higher parts of the uh, shrub and then take in the sun, presumably, to help that digestion process um, along. Now, this guy here, he's got stripes, and he lives in spinifex, and he never leaves the spinifex, so that's another invention of this um, obligate spinifex dwelling type existence in a gecko. Um, now, this one is also across all of Australia, and it also lives in spinifex, but it doesn't have the um, stripes. But I've got a, um, a friend, um, uh, Mag Peterson, and his he had a really good idea. He said, maybe the spots are like you're looking into a spinifex clump, and it's like the needles are coming out at you. <laughs> I don't know. It's a, it's a theory. Um, it's a crazy theory, but um, I guess you don't always have to have stripes to um, be an obligate spinifex dweller. Again, it's um, nature being mischievous and not always having the same sort of pattern. All right, so we're still in the climbing in the climbing zone. Here's another fairly diverse group of geckos. Um, but these guys like rocks and uh, trees. Uh, yep, so the guys on the left, these are the big um, marble geckos. And they are, well, one kind of marble gecko. That's a term, a common name that gets used for more than one gecko, as we'll see. So those guys are quite big on the um, upper left. So they can be about this sort of big and they're running around with geckos that are this little big, uh, that big, and um, yeah, so that marmorata species, that likes to eat other geckos. Um, it'll eat big cockroaches and grasshoppers and that sort of stuff. So they're quite a chompy thing. Now, the little guy on the lower left, that's actually a baby of the big guy. So when the babies come out, they have that really contrasting black and white pattern for some reason. I don't know why they have it, because when I see those little black and white pattern, I say, oh, there he is. So I don't know why it's <laughs> designed that way, but um, they'll eventually lose those black and white banding. And you can see some of the, um, the adult banding has the same sort of stripes corresponding to it. Those are from the, um, both from Wagga Rock. So that's quite a, a, a big group in diversity, big geckos, really spectacular species. Um, now, this is another local guy. That's the southwest. Where's my... There, there he is. <laughs> There's the, um, that's uh, Adura reticulata that lives in smooth bark eucalypts in the southwest. So, and I've seen these guys 15, 20 meters right up, right up in these smooth bark trees, and that's, that's where they live. Um, they're quite long-lived as well. Uh, Rick Howe at the WA Museum has um, studied a population, uh, used to study a population, and some of the individuals were at least 12, 15 years old for um, a gecko that, that big. And that's the thing about these little um, geckos especially, but other animals as well. Um, even though they're small, they can be um, quite long-lived. Um, my gallimorph spiders can live 20, 25 years. So... This guy up here is a well, upper right. <laughs> that's a, um, a northern type of Adira, and that's sort of a, a low shrub, skinny tree type, type guy. I've seen those guys um, on rocks and trees, and they're quite good leapers, especially when it's a nice hot night when you're up in the Kimberley. Um, they're really hard to catch. All right, well, this is the... Um, the barking gecko, this is a local species you guys might have seen under the wood pile or something. Um, really nice species. Um, the reason they have the, um, they're called barking geckos is the, the guy in the lower right is sort of doing it. They, um, if you disturb them enough, well, the first instinct is to bolt, go to somewhere dark and out of the way. But if you corner these guys and they, they don't feel they can get away, they'll They'll arch their back and raise up right on their tippy toes, and then they'll start going, eh, eh, eh. <laughs> and 
And if you get too close, they'll latch on you with those big jaws. And um, so I think the idea is to give like a, um, you know, a qual or, or something like that. Just pause for thought um, because if it gets on to you, like a, like a bobtail or something, it's, it's going to be trouble. But that's, that's why they're um, called barking, barking geckos. They're really nice and you can, you know, try under the wood pile on the weekend. There might be some there. Now, that's, that, that guy has sort of a tail with a long, thin uh, point, sort of a normal tail. Um, but that's part of, it's sort of a, an older member of this whole group of what are called knobtail geckos. So if you look on the end of each of these geckos' tails, there's a little knob full of nerve endings. Um, and the mystery is no one knows what the heck it's for. Um, now, the barking gecko and a lot of other geckos, if you corner them, they'll start waving their tail around. It's that whole idea where um, they might sacrifice the tail, but the rest of the gecko can get away. Um, so these guys do that as well. So the knob, as an explanation, doesn't seem to be, um, may not be the right one. Um, another explanation which I was excited about when I heard about it, was um, people were observing them dragging the knob in the sand dunes. Now, most of these are sort of arid, arid zone species um, in sandy areas. So maybe they're listening for predators with the nerves and the tail. Maybe they're um, detecting spider, pitter-patter, like Dune the movie or something like that. I don't know. Um, so there's a, quite a variety of those. But these guys are the rock-dwelling knobtails. So that, that was disappointing because it's like, well, there goes that vibration hypothesis because where these, these guys are on sort of big scree boulder areas where probably not a lot of vibrations are going to be transmitted. So um, there's a northern species on the left there that's a, a nice big one. I've been bit by those too. <laughs> and there's a couple of, um, uh, there's a pilbara one and then sort of a Gascoigne rock dweller. They sort of look like rocks a bit. They don't run away, they don't run away too fast either. Um, but yeah, really, really nice geckos and it's fair game about what the knob does. It's sort of one of those endearing type uh, biological mysteries because at some intuitive level, if um, you know, natural selection has made the knob have nerves in it, the nerves must do something. So your guess is as good as mine. Right, so legless geckos. I'm always trying to um, tell people about um, geckos and pygopods and how pygopods aren't related to geckos. They are geckos. So if there's anything you're going to learn today, you can wake up and go, pygopods are geckos, okay? <laughs> That's the main, it's the main thing you can learn. So. Um, now, with these guys, it's a bit counterintuitive because there's no, um, unlike in skinks or st and some other groups, there's no sort of missing links where there's something with reduced toes or sort of a half a gecko, half a pygopod. Um, these guys are just very long and snake-like. Um, now, the one in the upper left, that's a pygopus. That's a primitive member of this group. And like your car carpet pythons, it does have these flaps that are... Um, you know, obvious relics of limbs in a former leggy life. Um, now, as far as um, how to tell these from snakes, there's a few um, tricks. These guys have ear holes. Um, snakes don't. That's one. Um, these guys have a long, have, have that um, short, thick tongue, a gecko-y tongue. Um, and like other geckos, they use that tongue to uh, give their uh, eyes a windscreen wash. They, they stick out their tongue, and that's how they, they clean their eyes, whereas a snake will have that forked tongue very active. Um, another interesting thing, another major difference is a snake, if this is an average snake, then maybe the tail might be this long. Um, in some of these guys, if the, the whole thing is, is this long, the tail might be that long four times as long as the body. 
Um, so once in a while, an unfortunate pygopod might lose its whole tail, and it'll go from being this long to this long. It's got to probably have to do a lot of explaining when he gets home. Um, <laughs> it must be, um, yeah, so that, I guess that's another um, use of the tail, because we've seen it grip, we've seen it block burrows, we've seen the knob, whatever that's for. Um, and this is using uh, the tail as kind of a snake-like body, because um, that's, that's how um, they're divided. Now, these guys on the bottom, there are two different sort of um, groups. The guy on the left is a pygopus type species, and the guy on the right is a delma. And basically, they're, they're brown snake mimics. A lot of juvenile brown snakes have that black head. And so this is that case where nature, um, these very tasty edible species, are basically saying to a would-be predator, I'm a brown snake. Don't eat me. Leave me alone. Um, and even the pygopus will flick its tongue a bit more rapidly like a snake and even do this sort of uh, rising up like a snake. So that's um, a case of mimicry. So um, it's another thing to look out for. Might want to pause before um, hurting, hurting them if it's just a pygopod. Okay, well, that's, that's sort of the ancient guys, those... Those groups have been in Australia before Australia was Australia. That's how long they've been here. They've been here a long time. Um, these guys are more recent. So this is the, the family Gaganidae and this genus Gahira. They're also in the Pacific Islands. And once upon a time, they got to Australia. And then they exploded in diversity. So they're all through the arid zone. Um, they're one of the most common geckos out there, very uniform in shape. Um, and the smallest ones are about this big and the largest ones are about that big. So relatively similar shape, relatively um, small body size range. Um, again, if you've got the grippers, and we'll see this, we've seen this before, we'll see this even with the frogs. If you've got grippers, you can do rocks, you can do trees, and there's a lot of speciation back and forth between the two. And for a taxonomist, it can be very confusing. Um, but I kind of like being confused sometimes. Um, so these reddish guys with the polka dots, they are the rock dwellers. So there's um, the one on the upper left is a, is a gas coin one. The one on the lower left is a more, more sort of on the ground one um, in the Kimberley. The, the big one on top, he's more likely to be on big vertical boulders. There's, there's a quite diverse, that group. The guys on the right are the more woodsy sort of things. Um, they're also fairly common. You might find these also in your shed or in the wood pile. Um, it, and they um, tend to be sort of more of the bluey gray. Um, really hard to tell apart. A nightmare taxonomically. But somebody's got to do it. <laughs> okay. Now the other sort of main group of um, very common group of Gekonidae's are these heteronodia types. And the ones on the left and the bottom, that's the binos gecko. Now, when you first start out looking for lizards, um, this is what you'll find. And herpetologists um, tend to call this one the, the rubbish, rubbish gecko because um, we love going to tips and looking for snakes and things like that. And we'll be lifting up bits of tin that's... You know, when a herpetologist sees lots of tin laying around, it's like, oh, heaven. And, you, and you, um, you're looking it up for uh, barking geckos and snakes and stuff, and you'll see those little binos geckos, and you go, ah, oh, another binos. You know, and they're, they're just everywhere. Um, there's a few funny things going on with them. You see the sort of speckly one on the, on the left. That's one sort of cryptic species. The one on the bottom is a different kind of cryptic species. And in some areas of Australia, this is kind of weird, they, um, you'll pick one up and it'll be a female. And you'll pick one up and there'll be another female. And there's these huge areas of the arid zone where there's just clonal lineages of all females. Okay, so somewhere along the evolutionary line, they've just become clones. They don't have sex. They just, an egg hatches. It's always a female. She grows up. 
She has a funny feeling and then has an egg, which leads to an exact replica of her. And you get this happening over and over again. Um, there's a few theories of how this has happened. Um, it's also happened in some other um, groups and um, fish as well. This has happened. Um, but one observation is that these clonal lineages or clonal species, they all seem to be relatively recent inventions. They're all the tips of the twigs on the evolutionary tree. So um, there's an idea that in a constantly evolving and changing world, it's kind of a bad idea to be a clone because the rest of the world goes this way and changes. And if you can only produce exact copies of yourself, um, those get lost in time. So um, maybe boys are necessary in the long run. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and this, um, this guy in the upper right, now those, those binos type geckos are all across Australia. If you look at the range map, it'll be like, here's Australia, and it's like, the whole thing is pretty much blacked out with those guys. But once in a while, they've wandered into um, the central ranges, the Pilbara, the Kimberley, the top end, and they've turned into these big banded sort of forms, um, a little bit bigger, and these strongly contrasting bands. Um, and those are the sort of the, the cave-dwelling geckos within that group. Those are quite nice. All right. So um, the, the one on the upper right, that's... The, another marbled gecko or velvet gecko sometimes. Um, it was quite surprising to find out their nearest relatives aren't with other Australian geckos, gecconines. Their nearest relatives are actually from Africa. Okay, so there's maybe that they rode over on a boab nut or something because there's just a very weird connection. You don't see that sort of connection very often. But they're here, so... Um, we can enjoy them, and they're quite nice geckos. And they are the number one gecko most likely to be in your garage or shed or woodpile. Um, very nice. And you can tell them apart from the other gaharas because they have a very thick tail, whereas the other gahara species will have a, uh, a bit of a thinner tail. The um, one on the lower right is the Asia-Pacific house gecko. This one's been slowly... Um, conquering the coastal areas of Australia and the north. This is the one that does that chit 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 when you go up to Darwin or Broome or, or um, Cairns or something like that. That's the one in your hotel running around or Hawaii on your, your screen door. Um, so they've been transported all over the world. Um, they're trying hard to keep them out of um, Barrow Island. They're all worried about them, and I gave them some, some advice to um, uh, help them try to um, colonize Barrow. Um, but they're, they're a fairly um, hard-to-control thing. There's also another sort of invader. It just showed up in Darwin a few years ago, um, the, the morning gecko. That's another sort of Pacific thing, and that one's also a clone. So the clones could be coming. It's not in WA yet, though. All right, so that's the, um, the uh, froggy bit. Um, now, just switching gears... Uh, that was the geckos. Here's the frogs. Um, the current species tally in uh, WA is about 83. I think it actually could be 84 if you count the cane toad. Um, so you have um, tree frogs. I'll explain why they're, that's in quotes. So about 26 species of those. You've got your lar large ground frogs. That's a, a Gondwanan group. Small ground ones. And those are um, our new species, for better or worse. Um, so starting out with the tree frogs. Now, most of these are um, green-type things. Um, I remember when I did the, the revised the WA Frog Book recently, um, you know, a lot of the frogs in WA and Australia are sort of brown, burrowing-type frogs, uh, most of them. Um, well, more so than these, these green climbing ones. And um, working with the publishers, it's like, you know, you write the book, and marketing gets to choose the cover, and you can better believe it's going to be one of these green, Kermit-like climbing things, which it is. So, But I'm okay with that. That's okay. Um, so there's two main groups in Australia so far. There's 
probably a bit more diversity than uh, the taxonomies reflected. But basically, the Latoria group are the green climbing guys. And then uh, the fellow on the left is a member of the um, Cyclorana group, which is the tree frogs that have gone underground. So they're um, champion burrowing arid zone frogs. Um, again, there's not many um, missing links. There might be one missing link in uh, Queensland, but you had that sort of ver two very um, diverse modes with a little bit of slop, which I'll go into a bit later. Now, the Limnodynast today, these are the sort of the big Gondwanan frogs. So if you like big things, this is the group for you. They're sort of big and cool, and they look, they have that sort of Gondwanan look about them. So um, I'll go over these um, in a bit, a bit more detail later on. And with um, Myobotrachidae, um, you've got sort of quite a few groups. These are the high diversity groups. You've got your crinia in the upper right, the pseudophrony in the lower right, the geocrinia is that yellow guy, um, and then the euperilia on the lower left, that's a quite a diverse group, and um, WA is sort of um, the most diverse place for those guys. There's tons of them. And they all sort of look and sound the same. It's a nightmare. And if you're small, that means there can be more of you, so there's more species and more genera than, than the big ones. Um, so you have your, your forward burrowing guys, which are everything but this one. That's the, the um, sunset frog that was discovered about 15, 20 years ago um, in the southwest. Um, but the other guys are all sort of forward burrowing frogs, and I'll go, talk about them in just a sec. All right, so I'll just go through a bit of the southwest um, breeding type. Um, because it's sort of like um, shift work for frogs in our uh, Mediterranean climate. So you get autumn breeders, which um, anticipate the coming of the rain in winter. You get your um, bread and butter winter breeders, which we're in now. Um, spring is your typical sort of um, Kermit froggy, froggy sort of mode. So that, I'll go sort of in that order. All right, so um, there's three main groups um, of these rain prognosticators. So it's pretty dry in summer because um, of our Mediterranean climate. Um, but once the first few rains hit in sort of April and May, these frogs get excited. And they go, whoop, it's, it's breeding time. Let's start, get active. Let's start to feed up. Um, maybe start making a move towards the breeding ground. So you've got your big Helioporus. Those are the big globular type frogs. You've got your there's two type of toadlets in um, WA. So you've got toadlet one, this, um, this guy on the lower right, the um, pseudophrony, false toad. And then that's another sort of geocrinia morph on the left. And I'll just explain how these guys work a bit. So, um, well, maybe it's time for some frog calls, huh? Pretty clever name, Hooting Frog. So these guys are one of the biggest Helioporus. Um, so they start to get busy um, before the serious rain starts. So they're sort of April, May breeders. They dig that long burrow. This is one that's been um, dug up. I worked with Marinensis a bit. All right, so these guys have these foam nests. So this is one that's dug up. So the male will call from the burrow, luring the female or, um, yeah, wooing her, let's say, into the burrow, and they um, mate at the bottom of the burrow. And then they'll put these, all this, the egg goo will sort of stay in the bottom of the burrow. The adults will leave. They'll go back under the log or wander back to their um, normal sort of uh, day job. And basically those eggs will develop up to a certain point, and then they'll just freeze at a certain developmental stage. Now, when they build these burrows, they don't just build them anywhere because they tend to build them in shallow depressions that will later um, in winter, when the water body comes up, it floods the burrows, 
And then one day the tadpoles get this um, deluge of water. Water comes crashing in, and then they break free of their eggs and swim out of the burrow and turn into normal sort of tadpoles. Oops. <laughs> Um, they can stay frozen um, probably, I think, about two months. So they're fairly large eggs. So the female gives them a bit of fuel, to um, a bit of emergency fuel to keep them going. But um, yeah, if it, it doesn't last forever if the rains don't come. And often you do get um, um, studying these with um, uh, out of um, Dale Roberts Lab in UWA because we, we go um, – to the same sort of area most years. And three out of five years, shh, nothing, nothing seems to survive that the rains don't come. You, you can have those sort of runs. And in some years, the water is there, everyone's happy, and that's probably, probably um, the main years of recruitment. So most of the adults in the population are probably from those good years. Um, but the, again, because they're long-lived, they can probably afford um, several bust years in a row, as long as they get a good one. All right, so that's the um, inornate uh, burrowing frog, whooping frog. So working with Marion, um, she gets really excited about these differences working with tadpoles because she's, ever since she was a girl, she's been obsessed with tadpoles. She's about, um, she's Retired um, high school music teacher, actually. Um, she's still crazy about tadpoles. And she'll rave about all these differences. And I just say, sure, Marion, I believe you. Um, but here's what these things turn into. So you've got your whooping frog on top. You've got your western spotted frog. That's a nice big um, wheat belt frog. It's really cool. You've got your um, sand frog there. And this guy here, let's see if I can crank him up. So that's your, uh, your moaner, moaning frog. So I get these um, every April and every May, I get these, my phone starts ringing and it's like, I can't sleep because there's um, frog outside my window, what do I do? Um, so I have to give advice about how to get how people can move these frogs on. All right, all right. There's one more. Oh, that's our Barry Cragus, our, our hooter again. So um, within Australia, there's only one species over east. Um, it's the giant burrowing frog, and we're lucky to have in um, WA. Five of these Heliopter species. You know, the classic big and one and frog, really great. All right, now here's these um, false toads, pseudo -phryne. Um Now, these guys also dig a little burrow. It's not as deep, it's not like a tube like the other ones. It's more of a sort of little scrape, or they find a little hollow, or, you know, it's just a little shallow depression. They're doing the exact same thing, though. They'll, um, they'll woo the female by um, uh, calling it from their little burrow, and um, the eggs will be on the side of the bank until those uh, water levels come up and flood the eggs. Tadpoles swim into the water. That's how it works. Um, so there's some Queensland species on the left, and that's our local species. It occurs around here as well, um, the crawling totalit on the right. Now, um, that makes for sort of a nice picture on the left with the, um, you know, you think a male and a female with all the eggs, looking after the eggs and stuff. Well, it turns out that um, uh, recent studies in uh, species over in the east um, from a, a, a WA um, a guy, surfy guy, who's done well in biology, Phil Byrne, and he, he found um, that actually the females and the, don't put all their eggs in one basket. Females listen to a lot of males, and they're only putting a few eggs in each male's burrow. So it's the females that are, are going around and spreading the eggs out quite a lot. So, um, and then after the, all the calling's done, they'll both leave. So um, 
it's not always the male that just gets around. The females can spread it around as, as well, the, the egg risk. Um, now, here's this geocrinia guy. This is, um, I'll, I'll talk about some other geocrinias in a second. This one's quite divergent. They're also doing the rain prognostication thing. They'll lay their eggs on um, vegetation ab above water bodies, where what will, what will be water bodies later, or on the sides um, in a bit of leaves like that. And that's a male um, calling from a position. So maybe it's um, the males are advertising a position, and the females might choose the male, but they might also choose how well the male's chosen his calling place. Um, to put the eggs. All right, and they um, do grow up into nice little froggies. Okay, well, this is the um, this is your bread and butter um, winter breeders, and I'll just um, crank up one of the guys on the upper right. So this guy, you should have, some of you guys might, if you have backyard ponds, you might have heard this one. Or if you go walking around wetlands, um, even in the day, they might give a little call. Uh, that's this guy in the upper right. They can be green or brown um, and any, any shape in between, any shade in between. All right. Yep. So these are your crinia species as well. Very diverse. There's um, uh, one main species around here, but you get further down south, there's a few different kind of species. They're your classic sort of, you know, almost like a, they're almost like an insect. I hope that's not insulting the frog. Of course it's not. They're insect-like, almost in their the way they they get around and eat other things and down there in the grass, really hard to find. And then. Um, the guy on the lower left is a, um, he's sort of a humming frog, another local guy. These are mostly arid, adapted things, but you do get a few in more colder weather. And I might have a call of him. You can hear why he's the humming frog. You can hear crinias in the background there. Did it, did, did. These ones also have that nice sort of cat eye, this um, group of frogs, very cool. That call um, sounds amazingly like a cane toad call, so sometimes I get calls about that as well. <laughs> um, now this is the um, quacking frog. Guess what he sounds like? So true to his name. He does quack. Um, these guys breed only in sort of late winter. This is a, a rock outcrop, and they love to breed in these boggy edges. Um, so these guys are quite funny in that the eggs are quite large. See in the lower left? They have a much l larger egg. So it's, again, that female giving the, the tadpole a little bit of extra food. They... Um, <coughs> Yep, so um, these guys have a very short tadpole phase. The other sort of crinias maybe take two or three months. These guys can come out in about four weeks. Um, the tadpoles don't even need to feed. Obviously, it helps um, them if, the, if there is food in these very nutrient-poor environments, but they can shoot through quite quickly. Now, this species also has a weird thing, which a lot of people investigated at UWA. Um, so... With those other crinia species, the male and the female will pair up for about, well, over 24 hours. They'll go around together once the decision's been made and lay the eggs here and lay the eggs there. And you can see them the next morning still together. You know, maybe we'll lay a few eggs over here and we'll go to another pond and lay a few more eggs. Totally different in these, um, in this species. Uh, for one, that these males have absolutely massive arms. So you, sometimes you see this dimorphism. And basically the female lays her eggs all in about 10, 15, 20 minutes. And so what happens in these choruses is one male might grab on 
But because there's all these eggs to be fertilized, you get all sorts of other males jumping on. So there's like double, triple matings where all these males are jumping on the female, um, in some cases even drowning the female. So it's this crazy sort of mating system um, that's been fairly well studied. But again, nature throws up these weird things. All right. More spring breeders. Um, I'm sure you've heard this one. This is Mr. Banjo on the left. Um, these guys also sometimes have big arms and might be in some funny business. And, um, yep, we got the slender on the upper right, a motorbike, and more crinia because there's always lots of crinia. So these are your standard sort of species that um, you got that combination in Perth and in the southwest where you've got a lot of the rain coming in the cold um, part of the year, but when the heat and the rain sort of mix together, you get a lot of happy cavorting frogs. All right, now here's another spring breeder. Now this, these are um, photos by Marion who... Um, Worked quite hard in the southwest to get these. Um, these are the uh, roseate frog. This is not one of the endangered ones, but um, there are some I'll show you in a second which are. Now, these are sort of in a weird zone. They're sort of like normal tadpole type species, and they're sort of on land as well. So if you look on the picture on the right, you can see... Let's see if this works. No. Um, you can see this little depression there. I think there might be one or two more. And that's the little burrow where the male and the females lay the eggs. And so what goes on there? Well, not much. Because the, they have a normal tadpole. Again, the female makes quite a large egg, which is the, the fuel pack. Um, and the tadpoles don't really feed. They just sit in the, the nest and go around and around and um, absorb that yolk, that energy in the yolk, and they don't go anywhere because there's nowhere to go. That is their developmental world. Um, so here's the yellow-bellied frog. Now this is; um, these are all sort of fairly similar. Um, they do they do have this one's a bit more interesting looking. That tadpole. This is one of the endangered species um, that we have in the southwest. And they do get their act together eventually and turn into nice, cute little um, tiny frogs. And I'll just see if I can get one up here. It's not too bombastic. It's subtle. Now here's the white-bellied frog. This is another... Um, Endangered species, slightly different call, very subtly different. The, um, they have white bellies, um, the other ones don't. There's a bit of genetic separation, um, but these species are just hanging on. Um, actually, I was um, talking to um, Helen Robinson at the zoo um, last week for for something else, and they've had a big captive breeding program at the, um, the zoo to get the numbers up because this is on very, this um, species is not doing too well. The number of adults is quite small. Um, and they're out there in the woods, um, and they um, heard some calling males, and they came across a great big marijuana plantation, and the, uh, but the growers had put all this... Um, weed killer and killed all the vegetation and there was no um, uh, successful burrows because of all the poison they put around. Um, so it was all illegal in the national park. Um, but anyway, that's the last thing the species needs. <laughs> so they had to go in there with police escort and destroy all the plants and um, hopefully they won't, they won't come back again. That's the um, things you have to deal with in conservation. And there's another little tadpole and another little emergling. 
All right. Well, um, this is a this is one of our famous frogs in the southwest. This guy doesn't have any um, tadpole at all. So it's a sand dweller. It lives deep in the sand. It spends its whole life in the sand. It's got those big arms because it goes forwards. A lot of the burrowing frogs I've talked about, um, almost all of them go backwards in a corkscrew or doing some sort of shimmy like that. Um, but these guys are, are quite weird, and they've lost a lot of their froggy features. And as you can see in the uh, Mary, Marion's Great Drawings, um, they, they already have their front arms forming. Now, one thing with tadpoles is you'll notice the back legs there, um, often in a tadpole phase, but they don't push out the front arms right until the very end. And actually, that's something to remember. When you see your tadpoles with the front arms out, that means they're about to um, metamorphose. It's almost like they're going, yeah. <laughs> and then this, but I always find um, this is a nice, nice picture. I always, this is a great picture by Brad. Uh, Marion, and this I find sort of separates the true froggers from the, the not so hardcore. If you if you can love this frog. <laughs> All right, now um, the turtle frog is pretty weird, and it's um, but it can kind of be understood a little bit better if you look at some of the, you know, again you're not supposed to say this in evolutionary circles, missing links or transitional forms, okay? So uh, the turtle frog lives deep underground. It's lost a lot of its pigment. It's got really big arms. These guys on the right um, are sandhill frogs. The upper one is from Shark Bay. And this is uh, your local new species, which I came up here a couple of years ago to um, uh, announce. That's the southern sandhill frog there. That's from um, Calberry. So um, these guys look a little bit more froggy. This guy is probably a bit more hardcore in the um, turtle frog department. He looks a bit more frog-like, a bit more Kermit, Kermit-like personality, perhaps. Um, so these guys also live underground in the sand. Now, it turns out their closest relative, those three, is this guy here, uh, the forest froglet from the Jara Forest down south. And... This one also doesn't have tadpoles. It lays its eggs in leaf litter or under logs or something like that. And again, once the egg hatches out, it turns out into a miniature of the adult. Now, this guy doesn't, um, doesn't really hop. He's a leaf litter dweller. He's only in the forest. And so um, there's a, another sort of example of this kind of evolution in New Guinea where you have... It's very rare in the frog world to have these burrowers under, underground like the turtle frog. But in New Guinea, you have some of those. And their nearest relatives are these leaf litter dwellers, which might be making their way through the leaf litter like this, and then one day decide to go underground or something like that. I mean, there's a bit of um, joining the dots a bit, but you can see how that sort of might work. And these three plus the turtle frog are definitely their nearest relatives in one group. So that's that nice sort of evolutionary transition. All right. Well, here's a few arid zone species. Um, these guys, because the arid zone, you don't want to be out there in a four-wheel drive when it rains, which is where you want to be um, if you're a frogger. Um, if it's not raining, there's not a whole lot of froggy action. So it's the information from the arid zone trickles in quite slowly. And if you're out there when it's raining, then you know, you make the best of it, definitely. Um, I'll just play you a few calls. We'll try the um, rubella frog. We call him the seagull frog sometimes. He's the middle guy. I guess it's in the um, ear of the beholder in some of these species. Um, the guy on top, he's a Cyclorana species. He's that same one I showed you when I first told you about Cyclorana. So that's the, um, the flat-headed frog. So you ha 
you see how he has a quite a flat head and his toes are very fully webbed so he's um that species is quite committed to um, floating in the water and it's a high highly predatory species of other frogs so what he does he's got that crocodile sort of head with the, the eyes sticking out and the fully webbed feet so he'll go cruising around in these temporary ponds eating the other frogs on the side um, even go the tadpoles a little bit you know it's a frog we shouldn't judge cannibalism they're all very cannibalistic and then um, when the pond dries out he just burrows down and he's got all the food in his guts and he might come up a year later when it rains and the process will repeat. So I think things like that are quite cool. All right, now we're running out of time, so I'll just go quickly through the um, Kimberly frogs. Here's a few more Kermit-like tree frogs. Very pretty. Um, now one of my favorite frog calls is um, the one on the left, which um, has to be heard. So these, these, are, um, these are the real party frog. They don't start calling till well after midnight, and they'll call right into the morning. And they'll, for some reason, they just, um, Cool call. Those guys, um, it's just a weird system they have. They have that complex call, and once the other frogs, like I was saying, um, you know, after midnight, 2 a.m., the other frogs are starting to quiet down. These guys are just starting, and they're one of the few frogs I've ever encountered that um, it'll be an hour or two into daylight, and there'll be birds calling, and they're still going. So I don't know what's going on. And also, another weird thing with these guys is. The males can be about 35 millimeters big. The females are like twice as big. The females are these giant things compared to the males. So, again, there's a mystery there that um, needs to be solved. Okay, if you've got your tree grippers, you can go on rocks. So there's a few um, rocky-type forms. I've already introduced you to some uh, burrowing cyclorana. There's um, quite a few species in this group. Very cool. They're one of these explosive breeders that on a certain night, they'll all come out of the ground, do this crazy mating activity, and then you just won't see them for the rest of the season. This is another sort of uh, burrower. Um, it's all the same species, like with that gecko with the racing stripe and the, the blotches. It's just this weird polymorphism. So you've got your sort of ornate pattern on the left, your racing stripe on the right, and then you got your tomato sort of pattern on the upper left. Um, these are some Kimberly species related to the banjo frog, um, and they're reasonably diverse in the Kimberly. Here's these um, Euperelia toadlets. They're really tiny. They make all sorts of grunts and clicks, and um, I'm trying to work through them um, Describing a few species here and there. This is the species, uh, recent species that was discovered in this crevice behind our helicopter pilot Butch's um, tent. He's, um, we, we've used Butch a few times in the Kimberley. He's um, uh, Kimberley local. He's been living in Derby for a few years. He said, you know, sometimes it feels like the walls are closing in because, like, Derby's the biggest town he's ever lived in. Uh, he's a great, great bushy, great pilot, um, and takes us into these spots where we can find new species like this. And um, there are some crinia up north. These um, are sort of the normal brown ones. And the ones on the right is, was a new species um, we discovered and described last year, and that's uh, Luke from uh, Adelaide who um, discovered that species. I didn't believe him at first. Um, and now this, 
Crinia fimbriata is the species, and it's one of the um, top ten species put forward for Australia um, for the um, top species of, of the world. Um, and there's a website where you can go and vote. Um, there's things like barnacles and crabs and, you know, but you'd, you, of course you'd want to vote for a cool frog. It's the only <laughs> frog up there. All right, and I think I'll leave it there. I'd like to thank especially Brad Marion, who um, uh, always generously um, lets me use his photos. He's a frog and reptile nut and runs around all over Australia um, photographing things. That's, that's what he lives for, and you saw the result of his passion um, in this talk. Harry Butler has been a big supporter of the museum and of this lecture series. Um, DC, um, they usually have a bit more money than the museum, so I'm always happy to jump in their four-wheel drives and head off into um, faraway places in WA looking for stuff. Alcoa Frog Watch has supported um, a lot of my frog research um, throughout the years. And um, these are some of the um, people I've worked with. There's Brad, Crazy Brad on the left. Um, and there's a lot of fun to be had um, looking, looking for species out in the bush. Um, but you don't need to be a research scientist to do it. Um, anyone can do it. Um, and I hope some of the pictures I've showed you um, has brought to life some of these invisible kind of animals that are out there um, uh, that can be enjoyed. So I think I'll leave it there.